Great. If you would please pass your rocks into the bucket. I'll get to you. Some of you are too eager. Bless the people with little rocks. <laughs> All right, intern, bring those up to the front for me. <laughs> bring them up. Good luck. Good luck. I'm just trying. <laughs> Everybody has a rock. Oh, there's more. <laughs> I should have done this next week when a lot of you are going to be late. <laughs> We've got some people creating art. So everybody has a rock. And these are the burdens of your life. Now, some of you had big rocks. Some of you had smaller rocks. Some of you had rocks that were nice and clean. Some of you had rocks that were pretty dirty. In the church today, we have this mentality that the church is set up like a pyramid. And we have people, and then as you grow up to the top, you have uh, those in the church that are deacons and elders, and somewhere at the top sits the pastor. And I want to share with you that's a lie. Okay, the idea of that is a complete misunderstanding because see when Jesus came once and for all to do away with sin, he got rid of the classes of people. There is no clergy and laity or laity <laughs> and clergy. Th that doesn't exist because Peter tells us that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. All of us are priests. But we have this idea that we can take our rocks and we bring it to the pastor, oh, the Lord, and the pastor carries your rocks. And your pastor can't carry all of your rocks. And then we get frustrated because the pastor isn't carrying my rock. And because sometimes, oh no! the rocks fall down. Okay? <clears throat> okay, I gotta pick them up. Sometimes my bucket breaks. Sometimes I just have too much going on. I can see the rocks there on the floor, but I can't see the rocks that are in the bucket. And see, this is why this is a problem. Because God did not design His church or his body 
in this way. So we're going to do something a little bit different now. I'm going to show you how it's supposed to work. Camera, help me. There's a rock for you. Yeah, you can start handing them out. Everybody got a rock over here? Hmm? No, I didn't forget about the kids. They're, they're still here. They're the only ones talking. this in a minute, but I want to dismiss the kids to Sunday school. So I'm going to give you the short of it right here. Each one of you has a rock <coughs> with a name on it. It's your job to lift that name to the Father. To lift that person and their burdens to the Father. To intercede. To pray for them. To pray God's best for them. To pray God would do with them as He desires. That He would make of them what He requires of them to be. That they would be a tool fit for His hand. That what God would grow them and mature them and develop in them the Christ-like nature that each of us should have. So, children, you guys paid attention? The name on that rock is the person you are going to be praying for. Okay? So, teachers for Sunday school, I would appreciate it if you just take a minute 
and make sure each of the kids know exactly what this rock is for. This is not pet. You don't have to feed or water it. Okay? We pray for the person that that rock, that his name is on that rock. So we're going to go ahead and dismiss the children 12 and under and the Sunday school teachers to go ahead and go to the other building. <coughs> front of your bulletin you'll notice the scripture that we selected for today it's from uh, Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 and it says that we are to bear one another's burdens but it doesn't end there it also says something else by doing this by bearing one another's burdens we fulfill the law of Christ Okay. Now, think about that for a moment and, and all that that represents. Because what has Christ done for us? He tells us, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He tells us we are to cast all of our cares on him. Now, you know, we, we have complete random rocks the rock that you've got and put your name on may not represent your life at all. Because you may have got a little tiny rock and you may have a Herbert-sized rock problems. Now Herbert is our rock. Okay? He sits down at the end of our driveway. Several of you have met him. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, Herbert is a, a, a special rock to me because God has used Herbert to show me a lot of things. We were digging a trench to do some drain lines away from the house. And we had three lines to dig and we were almost finished with the third line. We only had about five feet to go and we were done. And we hit Herbert. <laughs> now Herbert is uh, about that big across, about that wide, about that tall. And we hit him smack dab in the middle. I thought, well, it's flexible drain pipe. We'll edge around him. And we went about a foot this way and couldn't get to the end. So we went the other way, went about a foot the other way and didn't get to the end. Now, this was probably a point of pride for me because at that point I'm like, this rock is not defeating me. <laughs> and so me and Christopher and Donovan and Benjamin set to. And we dug and we dug and we pried and we lifted. And between the four of us, we got Herbert out of the hole and out of the way. And man, that was a moment of victory. <laughs> Flipping that big old rock out of the way. Christopher immediately dubbed him Herbert. <laughs> Herbert the rock. Now we have Herbert, we have Norbert, we have Hubert. But Herbert is the, the master, he's the daddy. <laughs> but it took all of us working together in concert, in cooperation, to get Herbert out of the way. It took my neighbor's tractor to put him where I wanted him. Um, we all have burdens that we're carrying. And some of us have fairly small burdens in the grand scheme of things. Some of us have pervert size burdens. Some of us have the Rock of Gibraltar size problems. But the, the point is, I can sit here with some discernment and say, yeah, you know, the problem that you're dealing with, it's really not that big. But the problems I'm dealing with are huge. Why? Because I'm looking at my problems with my vision. And you guys can look at my problems and go, wow, I wish I had it so easy. God has orchestrated his body, the church, the fellowship of the saints, to work 
cooperatively, okay, to work together to further his purposes. Now, God has a lot of plans and a lot of purposes that he's revealed in his word, but, but some of these things are specific to the way the church is supposed to operate. We need each other. We need each other. Paul says it very clearly in Corinthians. He says, uh, you know, the ear cannot say to the nose, I don't need you. Nor can the nose say to the ear, I have no need of you. We have need, desperate need for the body of Christ. Now, why did God choose to put it this way? I don't know. He didn't consult me. He didn't ask me. He just, he does it. Now, that's kind of the, the cool thing about being sovereign, creator of everything. You get to make the rules. You get to decide how things operate. Why did God choose to let us breathe oxygen? Did anybody ever wonder that? God, why oxygen? How come we don't breathe water? Why don't we breathe nitrous oxide? Why do we need oxygen? It doesn't matter. He chose it to work that way because he knows best. And he chose the church to function cooperatively because it works the best. I can't imagine anybody in here has never been hurt in church. Um, I, I left church for uh, the better part of five years. And it wasn't even a direct attack against me. I was just fed up with the way people were acting. Uh, we went through a, a period where uh, we were really seeking God's will and, and trying to uh, follow his, his heart and his word. And we were kicked out of a church. We were told we were no longer welcome. And so we went to another church and and finally felt comfortable, started opening up, started getting knitted into the body. And, I mean, within two weeks, the church went through a massive split. And after a period of four years of going through a church that uh, made the last year being there very difficult and finally just told us they didn't want us, we went to a church and, and finally Christy and I both felt comfortable enough to get involved and, and commit to, to doing the work in the body. And the church splits. And pieces went flying every year. And all of a sudden I went from trying to have an internship with the pastor to doing everything I could to hold the church together because the pastor and his wife were so hurt, she quit coming to church altogether. And he was so hurt that it was the, all he could do was get there on Sunday to preach the message. And people were coming to me going, what's going on? I don't know. But I do know this, you got to pray. Don't talk about it, pray about it. Don't get together in your little clubs and your little groups and talk about what you think you know. Amen. Pray about it. Pray about it. Pray about it. And, you know, this was at a very particularly tough time in our life. Um, I was working two jobs. Christy was working two jobs. And we were picking up work where we could find it. We were trying to homeschool the kids. And we're trying to keep this church together. And I kept getting promises of... of you know, we're going to get it so you can come on full time and you won't have to work other jobs. We'll be able to take some of the burden off. And, and after about a year, I had, I had committed to doing three things in that church that I wanted to see God do. And at the end of that second year, God had accomplished all three of them. And the church, they, they didn't do what they were promising to do. And, and quite honestly, I got frustrated. I got fed up. I got sick and tired of the crap that so often attends church. And we decided, uh, I came home one night after a leadership meeting where, again, nothing was done. And Christy was waiting for me. It was about 11 o'clock at night. And she said, well, what, what did they decide? I said, sweetie, they didn't decide anything. They didn't even bring it up. And she just broke down crying. <coughs> and she said, I can't do this. I can't keep doing this. I said, OK. And at that moment, I made a decision that I, I'm convinced was probably the wrong decision. I decided, I'm done. I'm going to go work. And I called my brother in Houston and said, hey, you guys still hiring at the company that you're working for? Yeah. I said, okay. I said, we'll be there in about four weeks. And I gave my notice at the church, and I walked away from the body. Now, I went to church periodically. You know, Christy would guilt me into going. And I'd go, and I'd sit in the back. Just like this. 
matter of fact, some of you probably remember me <coughs> coming to this church. Yep. <laughs> And then in my self-righteousness, I would uh, bring my notebook, and instead of taking notes on the message and what I should have been paying attention to, I was critiquing everything. No, actually, I wasn't critiquing. I was criticizing everything. Oh, oh my. Worship needs lots of help. Oh, oh my. Worship is too professional. These people need to amateur it up. Oh my. They need less piano and more guitar. Oh, good Lord. Can you believe they're playing electric guitar? <laughs> the pastor speaks too long. The pastor didn't say enough. The pastor interpreted that passage incorrectly. And I made list after list after list of all my complaints. And I was attending, but I was not participating. I was not being knitted in. I was not allowing God to use me. And I was not allowing God to touch me. And that went on for five years in Houston, and I was bitter. I was very angry at the church. I was angry with God because I felt like God had failed me. I knew that I knew that I knew that God had called me. <coughs> I know when I was five years old that God spoke that he wanted me to serve him. I went to uh, Bible school against my will because, man, I was set up to go in the military. I was going to be the first band note to be an officer, and all the paperwork was done. They wanted me to send me to school, and they looked at it and said, hey, oh, oh, wait a minute, you're a diabetic? Well, yeah. Well, we don't take diabetics. Well, I told the guy when I first came in I was a diabetic. He said it was okay. Well, you know, he works for the military. He doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> well, so do you. And there went all my hopes. And so what was my other option? I had a scholarship to go to a couple different schools. I had a music scholarship. I could go to the CU in Colorado and study music. I had a very minor $500 scholarship to go to a Christian college. And I prayed about it, and I was frustrated because God didn't let me do what I wanted to do, but I knew it was his purpose. And I prayed about it, and I went to a Bible school. And then I graduated Bible school and went to that first church that kicked us out. And then went to the second church that split. And then I came here. We moved back here. We went to a church down in Hamilton. Uh, we're there for a, a better part of a year. And I saw some things that I was concerned about. And I was really, God was speaking to my heart and trying to lead me and guide me back to him to getting my feet planted firmly. And I saw some things that I was concerned about. And I went and I talked to the pastor. And he told me, my church, if you don't like it, you can leave. And so I left. And we went to another church. And I still had my list and my notebook and... And, you know, they were doing some things, and I went, man, this is not the place for me. But at the same time, we were doing hockey. We were running the Bitterroot Valley Roller Hockey League. And uh, Scott Edmund came down, and he signed up to play. And, and uh, Kathy came down and was watching him play. And Kathy and Christy struck up a friendship. And Kathy was asking, you know, what church we attend. And at that point, we weren't attending because I, I don't know about you guys. I hate church shopping. I hate new things. I like what's tried and true. <coughs> and Kathy said, well, you know, our kids at that point, uh, Cam and Bethany were playing in our league. Uh, <coughs> Chance had come and played a couple times with us. She said, well, our kids are doing worship at our church this Sunday. Would you guys like to come and hear them? That was January 9th of what year? 2005. 2005. So we came to the church and <coughs> Mary Lou greeted me at the door. <laughs> She's friendly. <laughs> too close, a little too close. <laughs> and we came and, and we, we listened to the service and I started making my notes. And the first note, this looked like an old lady decrepit tea house. <laughs> well, you guys remember the white panel boards that we had that were falling apart and the water stains in the corner there and and the stuff that fell out of the 70s and landed in our kitchen. <laughs> and, and, and we, you know, and everything was green. And, and the, the water was green. And, 
and and Kelly played the drums vigorously and loudly and uh, <laughs> the piano. And I wrote, you know, the I, I need to need to hear the piano. <laughs> uh, I, honestly, I don't even know what Kelly spoke on, but I know I graded it. <laughs> <laughs> and so we walked out, and Christy, uh, God, God was always had a ready ear for Christy. And even though she went through the same hurts that I did, she was much more willing to move back into the things that God wanted of us in measure. Because see, when I do something, I'm either all in or I'm all out. You might get me to show up, but if I'm not, if I'm not into it, I'm, I'm just going through the motions. But Christy wanted to be in in measure. And so on the way home, she asked what I thought of the church. And, church. You know, they didn't do anything goofy to make me run out. Well, you think, we think we'll, we'll go back? Well, we might give a shot in another week or so. And so for the first few months, we came, uh, we'd hit it one or two Sundays and then miss a couple Sundays and then come a Sunday and miss a Sunday. And <clears throat> each time, uh, my list was growing longer and longer. <clears throat> and God started speaking to my heart and he started tearing down the walls that I built and softening the heart of stone that I had. And when he got me to the point where I could actually hear him and I would listen, uh, he spoke very sharply to Christy and I, and he said, okay, I want you to look at that list that you've made. Okay. I'm thinking, he's going to tell me I'm going to fix them. <laughs> he didn't. What he told me is, roll up your sleeves and get busy. You need to get in and help fix these things. And you know what happened? As soon as he said that, a lot of those things on that list got scratched out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can live with this. That's okay. But he, he really changed the direction and the focus of my heart. Now, I know all things are done for a purpose because God took me through some very ugly times and gave me a very poor vision of the church. I even told Christy at one point, I said, don't call me a Christian because I don't want people associating me with them. You can call me a Jesus freak or, or you know, somebody that follows Jesus, but I don't want the name Christian because I don't want people thinking I'm like one of them. You know, sitting here going, I don't want to be like them. I am like them. I am them. I'm doing the same thing that I'm griping about them about. But God took me to the point where he had to take away all my pre- disposed ideas about the body because see I, I went to school to study to become a pastor and you know oh, we learned eschatology and hermeneutics and um, soteriology and homiletics and, and we learned all of these fancy things like uh, uh, supralapsarianism and infralapsarianism and replacement and substitution and we, we learned all these fancy words and God showed me very quickly how much of that I didn't need because the first time I went outside of the church to <coughs> fulfill a ministry role, we were working at the youth center in Victor. And a girl comes in the door and says, uh, Mr. Van Note, I need to talk to you. Okay, great, great ministry opportunity. All right, God, I'm ready. Eddie's outside with a gun. He wants to kill Kelly. Uh -huh. Wait, what class was this in? <laughs> I took etiquette. I know which side the fork goes on. What do I do with a gun? Okay, I took eschatology. I know everything's coming to an end, but I don't want it to be my end right now. I took homiletics. I can preach him to death. He ain't going to listen. He's going to shoot me. God, what do I do? Right then I understood. God made it very clear to me. You can have all the learning in the world, but without God, you have a form of godliness, but no power. Right then and there, I have to throw myself before the mercy seat of God and say, help me. Please, God, help me. I don't know what to do. Eddie did not shoot Kelly. I don't know that Eddie even had a gun. But Eddie became one of the kids in our youth group. Uh, he was tough. He was from L.A. He was from inner city L.A. His answer to everything was beat it up. You love someone, beat them up. You hate someone, beat them up more. <laughs> That's all he knew. But I tell you what, before we left that youth center, I was driving down the road. It was about three or four days before we were leaving here to go to Houston. And I saw Eddie on the side of the road. 
I pulled over and I was talking with him and a couple of guys, and one of the guys let out a string of profanity, and Eddie turned around, man, he popped it down his shoulder. Man, you don't use that kind of language around Pastor Glenn. You gotta show this man respect. Wow, okay. That, that's a far cry from the first thing that you told me when I came out and asked you if you had a gun. <laughs> so God started changing me and showing me how much I am in the way of him and how much I desperately need him. But God took me through a lot of hurt in the body of Christ. And he brought me to the point where I realized, yeah, you know what? If you want to serve in the ministry, I absolutely recommend you go to a Bible college. Why? Because they can show you things in scripture that you're not going to get on your own. But you know what? Going to Bible college does not necessarily prepare you for the ministry. Okay? Because we're all called to minister. Every one of us. Every one of us has God's Spirit that has sealed us unto Him. And God's Spirit that gives us gifts to accomplish God's purposes. I've seen some of your gifts. Wow. Wow. This church is blessed by the body that God has brought together here. We have some dynamically gifted people in this body. You know how many churches are easily twice our size that can't put together one worship team, much less two or possibly three? God has blessed this church. Do you know how many churches can't even get two or three people together to pray for the body? And yet we average 12 to 15 people that get together every Wednesday to pray for this body. Do you know how many churches don't even bother having a Sunday school? Because parents won't commit and the, the adults in the, the church will not commit to teaching the next generation. Do you know how many churches, when somebody calls with a need... Tells them, oh, you have to be a member of our church, or no, we don't do that. People call this church in need, and we have yet to answer their need. We may not answer it in the way that they're asking, but we answer their need. We have a food pantry, we have a wood pantry. People are in trouble and they need help out, they get in touch with me. I get in touch with the leaders, we talk about it, we seek God's will, and we move accordingly. And we have the ability to do so. Look at the financial report from last year. In a body this size, to have the giving that we do is incredible. We are incredibly blessed. But God brought me to the point where I had to put all of my learning aside. And he had to change my heart. Because, boy, I could do my, my introduction three-point sermon with a conclusion. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. Tell them everything you just told them. Make sure you put in a funny story. Add a couple homilies in there and, you know, make, make things kind of perk them up. When they start to fade, do another funny story. Make a loud noise. I, I knew all that. But that was not the person God needed to pastor this church. And God started changing in me my heart for people. Because i got to tell you, I don't like people. <laughs> people do stupid things. <laughs> I'm not a people person. Okay? Uh, when Christy and I first got married, we did not eat out. We went through the drive-thru and took it home. Because I didn't want to be around people. And she had to order because I didn't want to talk to people. And God had to start changing in me the nature of who I was and taking out Glenn and putting in Christ. And he started doing something that I didn't even realize was happening until somebody pointed out to me. He started putting you guys on my heart. And I'd hear burdens that you guys had and I'd weep before God and say, God, help them. And he took out a speaker and he put in a pastor, a shepherd's heart. Because, man, I'm not, I'm not a great speaker. I understand that. I know that. 
I, know, I listen to some of these guys that teach, and, and my roommate in Bible school, he's a dynamic speaker. Dynamic. But he readily confesses he has no heart for the people. People come to him with problems, and he goes, don't understand. He's got, he's got elders in his church that take <clears throat> care of that. His heart's drive is to be a speaker, to deliver the word of God, to touch people's lives with the reading and the speaking of the word of God. I understand. That's part of my job. I, I do the, the preaching here. But that's not my heart. My heart is to make sure you guys are okay. I don't want this church to get to the point where I can't know each and every one of you. I don't want it to get to the point where I have to go, I'm sorry, I, 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 I know you've been here for a year. I'm Pastor Glenn, how are you? John MacArthur, one of the students, is the president of the Student Ministerial Association, was graduating from Master's Seminary. And his father was a pastor, I believe it was in Wisconsin. And he called his dad and he said, Dad, I want you to come out and I want you to be here for my graduation. Uh, they're doing a, a banquet and John MacArthur's going to be there and, and I get to meet John MacArthur because of, of my grades and, and the position I'm in. And his dad's why well, I don't, I don't want to go meet John MacArthur. I mean, this is a, a man of God. I'm, I'm a pastor of a church. We've got like 27 people in our church. We're just a small church. And he said, Dad, I, I really want you to be there. And so his dad went and, and just hoping, please, God, don't, you know, let it be a hi, how you doing, and down the line I go. And, and, you know, they went through the banquet, and John MacArthur actually spent some time talking about this young man, and, and after the, the ceremony was over, he came up to, to this young man's father, and he said, you know, hey, I, you know, I'm John MacArthur, and um, I hear you're a pastor of a church. He said, yeah, tell, me, tell me about your church. And this guy was embarrassed. He said, you know, we're, we're, we're a pretty small church. We're, Rural, and we've got about you know 27, 30 families or members in our, our fellowship, and uh, you know it's a it's a it's a good church. And John MacArthur looked at me and said, "How I envy you." And the, the pastor he was taken aback. John MacArthur envies me. I mean, wow! You've you've written more books than I've read. Oops! Don't say that to him. <laughs> And you envy me, and he just looked at him quizzically, and, and John MacArthur said, yeah. He said, you know, God did an incredible thing with the work that, that he's given me to do. But he said, I, I have so many things that are going on and so many responsibilities and, and things that, that I have to take care of. He said, I, I don't have the opportunity to get out and know people like I used to. Everything has to be done quickly because I'm on a schedule. And, and, you know, the meet and greet, I don't get to meet and greet very many people. And he said, I miss the days of knowing my congregation." of knowing them. See, God had to give me a heart that could function in a capacity to serve you. But what God has not given me is more than 24 hours in a day. He's only given me a certain amount of time. I get the same amount of time that you guys do. And as hard as I try, on Sundays, every Sunday, somebody slips out the door that I didn't get to talk to, and I, ah! I wanted to talk to them. Just wanted to let them know I was thinking about them, praying for them. But I can't exchange, because if I'm talking with someone and I miss somebody else, and I reversed it, then I've missed the first person. See, that's why each of you has a rock. Because, see, together, we carry these burdens. Together. We lift these burdens up to God, and we ask him to deal with them. And sometimes God takes that burden and he puts it right back on us and says, I want you to do this. Last night, uh, it was about one o'clock and <clears throat> Christy was finishing her reading. I was laying in bed praying and God laid a young man on my heart. And I was praying for this young man and, and just, just asking that God would intervene in his life and God would do something for him. And God said, I want you to send him a message and let him know that you're praying for him. God, it's one o'clock in the morning. It's a text message. He'll get it when he gets up. God, I, isn't it enough that I'm just giving it to you? I want you to send him a message and let him know you're praying for him. 
God, my phone's plugged in. It's over there. I got to roll over. And we, you know, I, I, can, can I just, <clears throat> could I wait till morning? I, I have, I'll get up 10 minutes earlier and I'll send him the text <clears throat> in the morning. <clears throat> I felt that gentle push. <clears throat> okay, God, what do you want me to say? I told you. I want you to tell him that you're praying for him. Okay. <clears throat> What are you doing? I'm sending a note to so-and-so telling them I'm praying for him. And as soon as I put the phone down, I felt a burden that I didn't even know was there. <coughs> that was 1 o'clock. 3.30 I woke up, and there were three men on my heart. I don't, I don't know, I don't remember having a dream, but I woke up with three men very sharply etched in my mind, and I started praying for those three men. I don't even know what, what was going on with them. I have no idea. Okay, God, you woke, him, woke me up, put these into my thoughts. I'm praying for them. God, I lift them to you. You know everything that's going on with them. Answer their cries. Minister to their hearts. Strengthen their walk. Put them on the firm and sure foundation that is Jesus Christ. Help them, Father. Hear them and help them. <coughs> <coughs> I have had, <clears throat> excuse me, Christy, would you bring my water? <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> I have had several weeks now <clears throat> where things in this church have been growing exponentially. We went through a couple of years where there were very few issues in this church, at least that were brought to my attention. And about three weeks ago, things started popping up. And then it got to the point where I said, okay, God, my hands are full. Could you give me focus and direction? Let me know which of these things I can lay down and which I need to hold on to. God said, no, you need to give them all to me. Well, that's fine. I understand that. I understand that theologically. I pass them to you, but I'm the one they're looking to for answers. Give me the burdens. And he gave me a picture, and I shared it with you last week. I have a whole bunch of juggling balls, and I've thrown them all up in the air to God and said, okay, they're yours. And occasionally, he puts one right back in my hand. And when that one is in my hand, he gives me what I need to minister to that one. He is not giving me anything to minister to those because it's not the time for me to do that. He's taking care of that. And I tell you what, as soon as I'm done with this one, I give it back to him, he puts another one right in my hand. Sometimes, so unexpectedly, we have a day where nothing is planned. Absolutely nothing is planned. Great. I have stuff to do for brothers meeting that I've got to get together. I've got my message that I've got to prepare. I've got to look at, at what, less, what uh, message, what series we're going to do next. Uh, I've got some, I can spend some more time in prayer. Um, and Christy and I might even get some grocery shopping done. Boy, I run into so many people with problems at the grocery store. <laughs> I think, oh, we're going in to get three things. Man, I can be in and out of there in seven minutes. Back in the car, right turn, because all my trips are planned, so I make all right turns, except for the one to come home. <coughs> and boy, does God mess it up. And I walk in, and there will be people whose hearts are hurting, whose lives are in chaos, who are struggling with very difficult things, and in that moment, God puts it in my hand and says, this is why you're here. This is why you're here. Don't worry about fabric softener. Well, I wasn't really worried about fabric softener, God. That's Christy's stuff. I, I just I put it in when she tells me put it in. Don't worry about this. Focus on what I've given you. <clears throat> and then we get back from the grocery store, and a text pops up. Bink. Oh. Oh. Okay. All right, God, you know what's going on here. Give me direction. Sometimes I don't even get finished typing that. And somebody will call me. Or somebody will show up at the house. And everybody has burdens. 
And some of them are heavy burdens and they're wearisome and they're weighing you down. God has not designed you to carry those burdens. Just like he didn't design me to be able to carry all of yours. We have got to give those burdens to Christ. Boy, we're so selfish with our problems. We don't trust him. Oh, God, okay, here, no, yeah, no. God, will you please take it? Go ahead, take it, please. God, take it from me. Let go. Let go. I've got it. Okay. Let go. I will. I am. <laughs> Son, <coughs> let go of the problems and let me have them. <laughs> Okay. Can I have that one back? I don't know what to do without my problem. So God devised a plan whereby his body can get the help that it needs. Now God is sufficient. He is absolutely sufficient. But God uses people. He uses you and me. And he puts us in a place where we can minister to the needs of others. Where we can do what is needful. And sometimes it's just a phone call. Saying, hey, I was thinking about you today. How are you doing? Well, I was praying this morning. God laid you on my heart. Everything okay? Anything I can pray for you about? Oh, God, man, I don't even know that person. Well, how do you think it starts? Somebody's got to take the first step. Somebody's got to do that. Somebody's got to be will willing to look foolish and say, Hi, I'm Glenn. How are you? Great. What was your name again? Fantastic. Every single time I do that, I get knots in my stomach. Every single time. Every Sunday, I have knots in my stomach. Every Sunday, we get to the end of worship and I'm going, please, just one more. One more song. Just one more. I'm not ready. <clears throat> Bearing one another's burdens. Now look. Some of you guys don't share your burdens. I understand that. I don't like telling people what's going on in my life. I especially don't like telling people the bad things that are happening in my life. I don't like people thinking I'm weak, that I can't handle it. Uh, we were in church for two years with the family, and they invited us over to dinner, and we, I thought we were very close to this family. And um, the lady told Christy and I, well, we just want to get to know you guys, because you guys are, are really hard to get to know. Well, what do you want to know? I mean, ask me. I'm an open bit. That's none of your business. <laughs> Some of the pages are glued together on purpose. Look, God created you with gifts and talents and abilities. He's created some in here to, to be natural Fellowshippers, I mean, to be engaging. Mary Lou, I love you. <laughs> because if she hadn't greeted me at the door, there's probably no way I would have come back. There probably is no way I would have come back. Others of us, God has given uh, abilities to, to do things that, I mean, you know, I look at some of you guys that I go, it's broke. Oh, no, it's not. There you go. I love those people. So do I. <laughs> They keep me functioning. Some of you guys have the hearts of intercessors. And I know, I know that people are praying for me. I know. There are times when, especially in the middle of the night, I'm so sorry, Joan, that I wake up in the middle of the night and I know somebody's praying for me. And there's others of you that are, are gifted, with giving. I mean, you, you, it's this church, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it is 
after being serving in so many different churches that are just scraping by and trying to figure out, okay, how do we pay salaries? How do we pay for the electric bill? We don't have any money to bless anybody's need. And God has blessed this church with givers. And, and, and I got to tell you, some of the givers give a lot more than they are financially able to give. Some of the, the people that give in this church, I go, wow, I know approximately what they make. How can they afford to do this? Wow, God bless them. Bless them, Father. You have said in your word that you will open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing that they cannot contain. God, do that for them. We have others that are gifted with administration. They, man, they look at the chaos that's going on and say, all right, let's make order out of this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I look at it and I go, oh, good, spaghetti. <laughs> what do we do with it? Oh, I don't know, I'm not hungry. So I take that whole wad of the mess and I give it to somebody that's gifted with administration that looks at it and can see the order in the chaos. See, the point is, everybody in here is gifted. Everybody in here is valued. You go, oh, I wish I had this gift instead of the one I've got. Really? You don't think God was aware of what he was doing when he gave you that? But this one is so much more cool. Now, this one's awesome. Mine's just lame. Lame. Really? Because see, awesome by itself soon fades out without lame supporting it and giving it strength, giving it stability. It all works together. What you look at as lame, God looks at as a divine gift. We have to bear one another's burdens. Now, you, you notice my, my bucket is empty. There's a little bit of sand and gravel in the bottom. I don't want you to think that I am by any means excusing myself from lifting you guys up because every day Christy and I are praying for you guys. Oftentimes at night God wakes me up and lays people on my heart and says, hey, pray for them. First thing in the morning when I wake up, there's usually a couple of you on my mind. Sometimes it's just one person urgently pray for them. And you're getting my prayers with morning breath. <laughs> okay. When I have my quiet time with God, I sit down, I read the word, I type some texts to the people that I, I send encouraging, encouragement to, send some prayer requests to people that I know are praying for me, and then I sit quietly, and I just listen, see what he would say, and he'll put something on my heart, say, you know, they're, they're just not having a good day today, pray for them. Okay, God. God, put somebody in their path that's going to encourage them, speak to them. And if, you, if, if it would be your will, give me that opportunity. But see, if, if you guys are all waiting on me to get that done, some of you are going to walk away having not been touched. I've only got so many hours. As much as I wish I could meet with each of you every week, one-on-one, -on -one, personally, get to know you guys, because I know, man, you guys are so cool. You guys do so much to bless me. Uh, man, just this fellowship, the things that God has put together in this body, and I don't have to deal with a lot of the stuff other pastors have to deal with. I don't have to deal with the politics. I don't have to deal with, with oh, he said, she said. Uh, that, that stuff is, is almost never here. I can devote myself to praying for people and studying the word the way I'm supposed to. I just, I, I want to encourage you. This, I'm, I'm not pointing the fingers at anybody. But I tell you what, if God is speaking to your heart, and he wants something of you, that you've not been sure you want to give, give it. 
He wants you to make a point every day to call one person on the prayer list. Okay, I want you to take the church roster. Monday, I want you to cover these three. Just give them a call. Say, hey, I'm thinking about you praying for you. Leave them a voicemail. Hey, praying for you today. Hope everything's going okay. Tuesday, I want you to take these. You know, God says, hey, you know what? I want you to put together a Bible study on this. God, I don't know how to do a Bible study. Look, if you can read the Word, you can study the Word. You need help? Come talk to me. Man, I'll get you pushed in the right direction. But I tell you what, you've already got the teacher. His spirit living inside of you. Listen to him. He'll tell you what you need to do. Be willing to be used. Be willing to be used in whatever capacity God wants. And serve. Father, I bless you today. I thank you, God, for this body that you have brought together, that you have made your very own. Father, that you have paid the ultimate price to show us just how much you love us. Father, that there is no one in here that that price was not paid for. There is no one in here that you have not poured out everything for. Help us, Father, that we would be a people that bring you glory. Father, we would be a people that are ready to be used of you any moment. Willing, eager, straining to do what you desire, pressing on. Father, that we would fulfill the law of Christ, that we would bear one another's burdens, that we would lift each other up, that we would encourage, admonish, even if necessary, rebuke. But Father, always in love, <coughs> always with their best at heart, not mine, theirs. Help us, Father, to hear what your Spirit would say. Help us to be obedient. Help us to be bold. To have the courage to trust you. And Father, when we stumble, help us quickly back to our feet. Because you promised us that you were able to make us stand. And I bless you today, and I thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs>